I never thought that Saddam Hussein could really surprise me. But it turns out Saddam wrote four novels. Near the end of his life, he even began to identify more as a man of letters rather than the ruthless dictator most of us know about. Turns out, there is a lot that we don't know about even the most infamous of characters. I learned quite a bit about Saddam and America's foreign policy from Steve Cole's new book, The Achilles Trap, Saddam Hussein, CIA, and the Origins of America's Invasion of Iraq. Steve is a Pulitzer Prize-winning journalist who has served as president and CEO of New America and the dean of the Columbia University Graduate School of Journalism. He is currently a staff writer at The New Yorker. Our conversation touches on Saddam and his brutal regime, but also the decisions American presidential administrations made that led to two wars in Iraq. But this conversation really tries to challenge how we think about dictators and dictatorships. It does not excuse Saddam, but it does get away from some of the more common tropes to better understand what this difficult period of history means for how we think about dictatorship and democracy. Now, a few weeks ago, I had a conversation with Kurt Vyland about democratic resilience. You might remember that episode. One of the show's listeners, Jeff Hallett, had some very strong feelings and wrote an impressive response. It's posted on the website as Engage Democracy, a Proactive Defense. Please check it out. And if you want to write a response to an episode, please email it to me at jkempf at democracyparadox.com. I'm also happy to promote your response if you post it on another website or blog. The podcast is sponsored by the Kellogg Institute for International Studies, part of the Keough School of Global Affairs at the University of Notre Dame. The Kellogg Institute was founded by Guillermo O'Donnell, one of the giants of democratic thought, more than 40 years ago. It continues to sponsor research on democracy and human development. Check them out at kellogg.nd.edu. You'll find a link in the show notes to their website. But for now, this is my conversation with Steve Cole. Steve Cole, welcome to the Democracy Paradox. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Well, Steve, I found your book really interesting. It's called The Achilles Trap, Saddam Hussein, CIA, and the Origins of America's Invasion of Iraq. I wasn't quite sure how this book might fit into the present day when I read it, because it's about something that happened a long time ago now. But as I was reading it, I felt that there were a lot of themes that I think are very relevant to the present day. And one of those is how I think about dictators. I typically think of them as unqualified and without merit. I mean, almost cartoonish. And a big part of that is the characterization that I have in my mind of Saddam Hussein. I mean, he's almost the archetype of the dictator who somehow rose to power and really had no qualifications or reason to be there. But as I read your book, I found that my assumptions about him were very misplaced. Can you start out by just telling us a little bit about who Saddam Hussein was and maybe just a little bit about what he was actually like? Yeah, the short version is that he grew up in Iraq at a time of political tumult coups, counter-coups, assassinations. He came from a very hard place outside of Baghdad, grew up with a gun in his hand, made his way to Baghdad, entered political life essentially as an assassin or as a gunman on the periphery of other people's coup plots. But gradually, he proved to be savvier than his elders. And after a period in exile, he came back to Iraq and rode a tank into the Republican palace and joined comrades in declaring a revolution that ended up lasting until the American invasion in 2003. And he positioned himself first as vice president, and then soon he took absolute power. Now, he ruled through terror, as we all came to understand in America. He killed hundreds of thousands of his own citizens, gassed many thousands of Kurds to put down a rebellion against his rule, 
and started an unnecessary war with Iran that claimed a billion lives. So he has a terrible record, and it's easy to understand why analysts and leaders in the West just dismissed him as a cartoonish dictator with blood on his hands because he was a tyrant. But he ruled not only through terror. He had charisma. He had a vision of a modernizing Iraq that, at least initially, was, you know, pretty mainstream, rapid industrialization, an emphasis on education, literacy, healthcare, national infrastructure, national pride. And so he had a lot of energy. He managed to hold relationships with his close comrades, some of them for many decades through humor and gifts and other kinds of techniques. And none of these are completely unusual in the land of dictators, but I would just summarize that during the pandemic, when I was working on the book, I rewatched The Sopranos and I saw, I I would said to my wife at some point, oh, this is Tony Soprano. Now it all makes sense to me. And the parallels are really pretty strong. Yeah. What really came out to me was that the image of him as a tyrant and somebody who murdered his people and was aggressive in terms of foreign policy, in terms of creating unnecessary wars and putting this country in a bad position because of them. I mean, that was all true. The part that was surprising to me was the fact that he wasn't necessarily incompetent. He was somebody who, like you said, was very energetic, that he was constantly working on things. It just wasn't a, an image of Saddam Hussein that I typically have in my head. I mean, I would have thought of him as very lazy, as somebody who just expected other people to do things for him. But as I read your book, it made sense that somebody who was that energetic and that motivated and that driven would get to that position. The tragedy of it all was not that he was incompetent, but the fact that he didn't have his heart in the right place, that he didn't have his morals in the right place in terms of how he treated his own people and others. Yeah, I think that's right. And he, he was ambitious. That's where a lot of his energy came from. He really wanted glory in the Arab world in particular. And it's always hard to guess where somebody's ambition came from. He did not seem like a psychologically broken or troubled man. Like I think a lot of the cheap armchair psychoanalysis of him when we were trying to figure him out was that, oh, he must have been beaten by his father or he must have had a terrible kind of psychosis-inducing childhood. In fact, when you listen to him on these tapes or read the transcripts or read his correspondence, he's comfortable in his own skin. I mean, it's scary that he's comfortable in his own skin considering how many people he kills, but he's relaxed. He's stable. He builds stable relationships around him. He has a temper, yes, but A lot of people do, and it's not off the charts. There were myths that he would walk out of meetings and summon a cabinet official who had offended him, and then there would be a gunshot, and he would come back in and say, let's continue the meeting. That didn't happen. He didn't have to do that. He would just nod at someone, and then that person would disappear from the face of the earth without his hands on it. But it's a puzzle because, you know, as a writer, I had the space to try to humanize him without sanitizing him. That was kind of my mission. And to try to see the world from behind his eyes in order to explain his otherwise inexplicable behavior. And I think writers have the luxury of doing that. You sort of have permission. And also I had time and materials that weren't available when American presidents were trying to figure him out. But I started to think, You know, it's easy for me to do this, but our national leadership in domestic democratic politics, with all the competition that's baked in between parties and opposition and government, it's hard to get away with empathizing with the dictator. Like there's no, there's no reward. There's no domestic political reward for thinking reflectively about Kim Jong-un. I mean, you know, or even Vladimir Putin, even when the stakes are very high, all of the incentives in the system are to demonize and take the easy political points and to move on. And because these people are appalling, nobody's going to say that you have terrible judgment for simply demonizing someone like that and moving on. 
but it deprives you of critical information that you need to prevent security crises is what the Saddam Hussein case tells you. So you've got to figure out a better way if you're in charge of the country's security, I came to think. So let's dive into some of the policy choices that he made, particularly foreign policy. One of the earliest and most devastating mistakes that he made was to go to war with Iran. Why did he make that choice? I mean, why did he decide to attack Iran? And I want to kind of preface this by saying that he wasn't just ambitious and driven. I mean, you also note the fact that he was incredibly well-read. He was somebody who studied different ideas and tried to understand things. I mean, this isn't somebody who doesn't try to think through the policy consequences and doesn't try to find people to help him make these decisions. And yet he still made some terrible decisions, particularly in terms of foreign policy. Why does he go to war with Iran in the first place? Yeah, you're right. He's well-read. He's an autodidact. He's completely self-invented. I mean, he did this all on his own. And self-made folks are incredibly admirable. Like, wow, what drove you to do that? At the same time, he's not well-rounded. He doesn't have like a seminar going on with peers challenging his thoughts because nobody will interrupt him no matter what he's saying. So He's knowledgeable, but he can also be disoriented because he's so isolated from the information that he's absorbing in some ways, if that makes any sense. Anyway, why did he invade Iran? I mean, he grew up as a master, and this is his great, like Tony Soprano, like he is great at dealing with enemies. He can spot an enemy from a mile away. He can spot an enemy sitting in the chair next to him. And he has a very deeply thought through philosophy about how to deal with enemies. And when Ayatollah Khomeini took charge of Iran after the 1979 revolution, Saddam identified him as a threat, a mortal threat, because he was the leader of an expansionist Shia Islamic revolution. He had been living in exile in Saddam's Iraq, but Saddam had kicked him out. And he believed that Saddam was an apostate, not without reason by his own lights, because Saddam was not at that time a practicing religious man. He had some respect for the cultural traditions of Islam in Iraq, but that wasn't his shtick. He grew up in secular, revolutionary, socialist, pan-Arab, and that was the philosophy that he had imbibed, and that's how he lived. So Ayatollah Khomeini kept saying, I'm going to go to Baghdad and hang this guy from the nearest light post. That was part of his rhetoric when he was leading Iran. And so Saddam basically decided to invade because he thought he could knock Ayatollah Khomeini off before Khomeini came after him. That's the simplest way to think of it. And the reason he miscalculated was twofold, I think. One, he believed that Khomeini was weaker than he was because there was so much turmoil in Tehran at that time, around 1980, like a lot of factionalism, a lot of unsettled politics and even violence. And he thought, okay, I'm going to take advantage of this instability before he consolidates rule, and I'm going to go in there and make myself felt. And then he started the war in an area of Iran that has a large Arabic-speaking population. And he thought somehow this was friendly territory, and that was a miscalculation. So he went into an area that was as strongly nationalistic in opposition to Iraq as uh, Farsi-speaking, more traditionally Persian areas that he might have otherwise invaded. And then the last factor was he lost conviction and he was a bad general. So he went in, he stopped, and then he sort of thought, well, actually, I don't want to try to fight this war all the way to Tehran. He lost a lot of his air force early on, and he was believing that he could get out of the war fairly quickly maybe teach Ayatollah Khomeini a lesson and withdraw to the previous borders. But he miscalculated about how Khomeini would react. And so the war ended up dragging on for eight bloody years. Sounds like a lot of parallels to Putin's invasion of Ukraine. Yeah, that's a very good point. Yeah, very similar, except I suppose Putin rationalized the invasion through this historical myth-making about Ukraine belonging to Russia. But yeah, in terms of the military, the political military miscalculations, there's definitely some parallels. So you mentioned a little bit about Saddam's worldview and his ideology in terms of Arab socialism. It's a set of ideas that are a little bit foreign to people these days because we think of the Arab world 
tied so much more to the Islamic religion. We think of that as the driving force of all of its politics. That hasn't necessarily been the case throughout most of modern history. Can you tell us just a little bit about the ideology and kind of the political ideas behind Saddam's political movement, his political party, and what exactly they stood for? So the context is the end of colonialism in the Arab world, the rise of nationalism as a response to colonialism all across the Arab world. And in Iraq, there was a British-installed royal family in power through the Second World War and into the 1950s, and then a series of secular left nationalist anti-colonial parties arose in opposition to the royal family and started competing with one another, as you would find in lots of other places in the emerging world at that time. The military was important because they had the tanks and the planes to actually move against the government. And so some of these Arab nationalists, secular, socialist, different variations on that theme were wearing uniforms uh, and were leading these coup attempts. And others were intellectuals in universities or like Saddam, basically peasants who came to the city, got swept up in cafe society picked up a couple of guns and decided that they would join the revolution. And the main fault line, and this is really fascinating, I didn't really understand this well until I started digging into this as much time as I've spent reporting on the Middle East. The real fault line when Saddam came of political age in the 1960s was between the Communist Party in Iraq and the socialist, nationalist, pan-Arabs that he belonged to. And they hated each other more than they hated the British royal family in some ways. And of course, you can imagine this became a proxy fight of the Cold War competition between the United States and the Soviet Union. And I think Saddam's first encounters with the CIA were during the Kennedy administration when Kennedy was playing around with Arab nationalists like Saddam's group called the Arab Socialist Ba'ath Party as a third way alternative to hardcore Soviet-backed communists. Like, there was a big debate in Eisenhower and Kennedy's Washington. Are people like Saddam good enough to fight communism with? Or are they proto-communists themselves? If we back them, will they then just go to Moscow? Or what? And in the end, at critical times in the 1960s, we don't have all the records because the CIA hasn't declassified them, which suggests to me that it must be a really bad story after all this time. They still haven't declassified it. But they were clearly sympathetic to Saddam's Ba'athists against the communists and certainly assisted the first coup that brought them to power, which was accompanied by a slaughter of communists in the streets of Baghdad, which is maybe one of the reasons why the files haven't been released. In any event, there was a particular philosophy of pan-Arab nationalism that Saddam encountered during a period of exile in Cairo. When uh, Nasser was setting the Arab world on fire, the Egyptian pan-Arab nationalist, his rhetorical style, his anti-colonialism, his charismatic call to the Arab peoples to throw off the artificial borders of the colonialists and unite as a force in a new world, I mean, that really was ringing in Saddam's ears when he eventually came to power. But his particular group, deviated from Nasserism around matters of economics and philosophy. When you read the text, they're quite arid. And it's a little bit hard to tell whether this is really a blueprint for national development or just a bunch of philosophers drinking too much caffeine and trading sort of slogans and rhetoric. But what we can see from Saddam's actions is that the way he interpreted this intellectual inheritance was uh, national, state-led industrial policy like Nehru in India, sort of taking some ideas from the Soviet rapid industrialization, some ideas from the West, seeking the very best of the world's technology. So wanting to have both superpowers involved in Iraq's national development, but also to hold them at arm's length. That was kind of where he ended up. So... The United States preferred the Arab nationalists to the communists from pretty early date, it sounds like. When we get to the Iran-Iraq war, I mean, that's 20 some odd years after the Kennedy administration. 
how does the United States see its role in that war? I mean, to what extent does the United States really take a side and support Iraq? To what extent is it kind of look at both sides as bad guys in that war? Yeah, that's basically the question that governed the Reagan administration's debates about policy in that part of the Middle East from the time the war started in September 1980 until it ended in 1988. And essentially, they went from a declared policy of we're neutral, we're not going to send arms to either side, we would like this war to end. It's bad for our friends, the Saudis, the Kuwaitis, the smaller, weaker Persian Gulf neighbors of those two giants who were warring with one another. It's bad for shipping of oil. So we just think it it ought to settle down. Now, in private, what you can see in the Reagan administration's discourse, and occasionally it would burst into public with comments such as the infamous one by Henry Kissinger, who said something to the effect of, you know, it's just a shame that they both can't lose which was, you know, a sort of cynicism about if they are going to fight a war, a stalemate is probably in our interest. Let them weaken one another because, you know, Iran is obviously hostile to the United States, directly taking hostages, seized the embassy. And Iraq, in its ardent under Saddam rejectionism of Israel and its alliance with the radical, as seen in Washington, Arab states that rejected any accommodation.